Hello, um, welcome everyone to Educational Programs Session 5 at um, this year's 2020 virtual small sat meeting. Um, we all wish we were in Utah um, enjoying some Aggie ice cream and seeing each other in person, but I'm happy to welcome everyone to our online discussion of the great talks as always um, here at SmallSat. Um, so this session, um, I'm going to first talk a little bit about some of the ground rules um, and then introduce our moderator. Um, and then we'll go ahead and have um, everyone give their overviews of their talks and start the question and answering session. So um, because our wonderful moderator is um, in the path of um, the Hurricane Isaias right now and has been using her limited amount of power remaining to be with us, I'm going to handle the um, introductions and um, then she'll handle the, the questions. Um, so apologies in advance for the little bit of um, extra challenges in 2020 <laughs> for this session, um, but we'll, we'll get through it. So if everyone who's online um, could ask the questions in the question and answer feature. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom, there's the chat and then there's also a Q&A um, little bubble um, icon down there. We'd love the questions to go in the Q&A bubble. We'll also try to check the chat, but um, the Q&A bubble is preferred. Um, and um, you can ask them there and they'll be um, audible. Um, we're asking that everybody um, ask respectful um, questions that are um, non-combative and polite and kind and we'll, those will be the ones that we'll address. So anybody who wants to really give anyone a hard time, um, this is not, not the forum and we'll, um, we'll focus on the, the, the interesting questions. Um, and um, yeah, so, and then if there's time at the end, we'll open it up to more questions. Um, and um, we'll go ahead and monitor speaker time. So um, they have six minutes each. Um, so, okay, with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our moderator. Um, so we're really fortunate and grateful to have on the line, um, Dr. Joyce Winterton, who's the Senior Advisor for Education and Leadership Development in the NASA Suborbital and Special Orbital Projects Director at Goddard Space Flight Center, Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. So right, right on the coast right now. Um, she leads the educational opportunities for students, educators, and community partners based on NASA and Wallops Flight Facility missions and work, including sounding rockets, high altitude balloons, aircraft, and commercial launches. So thank you so much for being with us, Joyce, especially today um, under all of the challenges <laughs> that are literally outside your window right now. So welcome. Thank you. So I guess, Joyce, if it's okay with you, I'll go ahead and um, introduce the first um, group. Um, just give me a thumbs up if that's good with you. And I'll go that ahead and be do the pre-planned. Um, all right, so our first um, speaker today is ArcSat-1, um, a 1U CubeSat developed at the University of Arkansas. Um, and we have Cassandra Sands on the line to talk a little bit about it. Welcome, Cassandra. Hi, thanks. Thanks everyone for joining this morning. Um, so ArcSat-1 is a 1U CubeSat developed at the University of Arkansas. Uh, we're the first student satellite in the state. Um, we are part of the NASA CubeSat launch initiative. Uh, so we are originally manifested on SpaceX 21 resupply mission uh, because of COVID related delays that I'm sure a lot of uh, teams are facing right now. Uh, it's looking like SpaceX 23, uh, which is launching in March of 2021 with delivery end of this year. Um, so we have two primary science payloads. The first is a high power LED. Um, we should be able to see this from low Earth orbit and we're planning to track it from our ground station here on campus. Uh, the other is we call it the SSIB. It's a small satellite deorbiting system. It's essentially a balloon that inflates at the end of your science mission and would utilize aerodynamic drag to significantly reduce your orbital lifetime. Um, we also have a couple of follow-on projects. So ArcSat 2 is a 2U CubeSat. Um, it's following about nine months to a year after ArcSat 1 right now. So late 2021 or early 2022. 
Um, and everything is pretty much the same, except for uh, we're testing a nanosatellite uh, propulsion system uh, intended for attitude control. Uh, we also have some ongoing research, including my PhD research, um, that's investigating applications of a multiple uh, small, small spacecraft system uh, to measure planetary atmospheres um, elsewhere in the solar system. Uh, yeah, I think that's it for the summary. All right, great. great. Thanks, Cassandra. Yep. Thank you. Uh, very interesting paper. And uh, I do have a couple of questions. What is the most important lesson you learned from this CubeSat that's going to help you with the next one you're already working on? I don't know. I could probably book about what I've learned. Um, we have such, because we're a student team, we have such high turnover that um, probably the biggest thing that I've learned is that when we do learn how to do something to document it really well so that the people who are doing that next can really follow what was done and can tell and don't have to waste time, you know, reinvent, reinventing the wheel, basically. Okay. The nice thing about everybody doing these papers, they can relate to that <laughs> since they all have to deal with that student turnover. Uh, the other question, I was quite interested in uh, your balloon that was part of your mission. Sure. What level of confidence do you have uh, that that's going to work in lay terms? Like, of course it's going to work. We'll su be surprised or, well, it may or may not. Um, I think we would be surprised if it didn't work. So we have done a mostly successful inflation in a terrestrial vacuum chamber. Um, and inflating is a little easier on orbit because uh, such low pressure and microgravity, you know, you don't have to combat full gravitational effects. So I think we're pretty, I think we'd be surprised if it didn't work out. Great. Um, I'm going to be interested in watching this one and your next uh, small set you're working on this set. So thank you. All right. I had a question for Cassandra. Sure. Um, what are you going to be using to look at the LED on orbit? Uh, so we we have a student who graduated last year who worked on um, developing a ground tracking system. So um, essentially, we should be able to take spectroscopic measurements as well as like optical um, measurements of it. Uh, we don't have a full. Um, we have a, a a CAD design for a model that would that has azimuth and elevation control that we can rotate at the same time. It's not fully functional right now. It's not fully built. Um, but worst case, we could do like a manual tracking of it. Very cool. So we do have some questions from the Q&A. Um, so we're going to do a live answer for Seth Schistler's question. What type of propulsion is intended to be used for the next CubeSat? Um, so it's a water propylene glycol mixture, which was chosen because uh, of a lower freezing point and also inhibits expansion in space. Um, and there's like four uh, degree of freedom thrusters on it. Um, I don't know a ton of details about the propulsion system. It's not something I personally worked on, um, but it's water propylene glycol based. And there's a like MEMS micro channels that um, essentially it creates a phase change. So it's like a cold gas expansion. All right, great. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Yep. Um, so we'll go ahead and, um, and we have a couple more questions for you, but we'll take them at the end okay, and sure. try to get through all of our, our um, panelists. Okay, sounds good, thank you. All right, so our next panelist, um, I, I believe we're going to go to um, pre preparing SciSat 1, a look at Iowa State University's first CubeSat, and we have Matthew Nelson on the line um, to talk a little bit about a SciSat 1. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, so SciSat 1 is the first CubeSat satellite that we have done at Iowa State University. Um, this has been kind of an ongoing project for a while. Um, uh, it was something that we had started mm, realistically about five, six years ago. And um, especially in the last you know, three or so years, we really had some good momentum uh, with the students and everything. And 
uh, like a lot of other teams, we were slated to also launch uh, this summer. Of course, COVID-19 said otherwise. And uh, I believe we're also maybe on SpaceX uh, 23, I think the one that's coming up this spring um, that we're currently slated on. Uh, we're also doing this through an SSC SLI. Um, the payload that we have for this is a, a software-defined radio radiometer. Uh, and what that basically means is that we've taken as much as we can uh, with radiometer functions and moved it into a digital domain. Um, and so really the only thing that we have is we do have uh, low noise amplifiers to help boost the signal. Uh, and then everything else gets digitized into an FPGA board. Um, all the measurements are taken from there and then sent down. And one advantage for doing that is we actually do retain frequency information. So there are other types of uh, methods that we can apply to that, plus we can even do some uh, potential uh, interference mitigation if we need to. Even though the 1.4 gigahertz is supposed to be protected, um, as SMOS found out when they were launched a, a number of years ago, there was actually some interference on, on the 1.4 gigahertz um, band. Um, uh, this has been a, an extremely uh, valuable learning for, for all of us, for the faculty and the students. Um, uh, and uh, it was really helpful for the students, of course, to have that hands-on type of experience with it. So uh, we're really happy to kind of get things wrapped up with SciSat 1. Um, we're actually looking forward to working on a SciSat 2 next um, and then go from there. So I think that pretty much summarizes our paper. So. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, very interesting paper. So my first question for you is you had several opportunities for problem solving. Which do you think of those opportunities benefited the students the most? Um, I think with, with the problem solving, what we had was definitely with, um, let's see. I mean, there are so many of them. I mean, <laughs> I think just about all of them were really good. Um, the systems integration was probably very valuable for a lot of the students because the the students really learn because we we had a mix of a couple of different vendors plus we also had um, some stuff that we were doing in-house for the satellite as well too and so they learned very quickly that um, sometimes what's on the data sheet <laughs> it doesn't always match up <laughs> uh, they learn that you know even though they get their assurance oh yeah it should work it should work sometimes it doesn't work um, so i think that was probably one of the biggest things that they definitely learned a lot from that so yeah. Nothing like a real world experience. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, I was curious, uh, since you're looking at soil moisture, did you look at any of the data from NASA's GPM or SMAP missions where also looking at moisture and soil moisture? Yep. So we did look at some of the stuff from SMAP. Um, we, we took some hints um, from that as well, too. We actually, uh, Iowa State University is also a validation site. Um, for some of those satellites as well too. So um, this is actually based off of some of my master's work that I did and um, the faculty who does that in our agronomy department, I know very, very well. So yeah, we have done some correlation back and forth with them as well too uh, for that, so. Great, glad to hear that. I kind of assumed you might've been involved in that one. So that's yeah. good news. <laughs> so other questions there, Carrie? Um, we do have a couple other questions that I think um, we're trying to get through all the panelist intros and then we'll circle back for more questions. If that's okay. Um, at least that's my, my guidance <laughs> from the management. So I don't, let's we'll, do that. Yeah. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, introduce, um, I guess, um, Richard Freeman, who's here with Royce, Royce James. If Royce comes back online, I'm not sure if he'll be able to get back on. Um, talking from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and um, Air Force Institute of Technology, um, talking about building an academic community small sat program. So um, welcome, Richard. And um, if Royce is able to come back on, we'll say hi to him as well. Hi, Carrie. Can you hear me? This is actually Royce. Oh, hi, Royce. Yep, we can hear you. <laughs> hey, great. Just making sure. I was like, no. OK, I'm great. OK, good. Sorry. I'm, I'm glad you're back on. No, no worries. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, uh, happy Coast Guard Day. Uh, today is August the 4th. And in 1790, the US Coast Guard was formed. If you're an Hamilton fan, you probably already know that or if your kids are, uh, I hear it every day. Uh, <laughs> so, cool. And thanks for having us. Uh, we're happy to be here. Uh, it, 
building our academic community small set program is um, quite the undertaking. And in six minutes or less, I probably could do no justice. Uh, I will say definitely the Coast Guard is being the second smallest uh, service. Now that the Space Force has come on board, we can no longer take the smallest service, uh, but that probably won't last. Um, we have been very slow to utilize our space resources. And so the, uh, the Academy being the, the center really of all education in the Coast Guard uh, has taken the lead really in pushing forward our space uh, you know, footprint. And so we've uh, started to build partnerships uh, throughout the, not just the military, but also uh, with the national labs uh, to include uh, PPPL and NRL and AFRL <laughs> and all the RLs that you can think of pretty much. Uh, also doing some stuff with NASA as well. Um, and we've actually had a couple of spacecraft launch from Wallops uh, through Virginia space. So a lot of what our, our program is talking about in this paper is basically kind of where we've come in our approach to how we're going to uh, codify our space efforts and specifically in space, but also in energy. So um, basically we've been working with Virginia Space through their ThinSat program and we've developed a, a FixSat to uh, measure not only the normal parameters that they have in the Virginia Space suite, but also to measure uh, densities of plasmas in, uh, in low earth orbit, specifically around ISS, which is based off of the spade measurement that uh, Naval Research Lab has on the International Space Station. So we are going to launch, we have not yet launched, we also were moved because of COVID, it's a common occurrence, but we're actually glad for that because it's given us a chance to do a little more testing, um, our impedance probe. And that impedance probe we'll talk about more in detail in another talk on Thursday. But uh, what I really want us to emphasize in this project is specifically how we pulled in all the way from PhD level students all the way down to middle school students and incorporated them into this project centered really at the Coast Guard Academy with our cadets uh, all the way through going from learning how to do the modules, communicating just uh, from point to point, uh, going into uh, low altitude launches both on our balloons and our planned drone launch and then the high altitude launch and then our last uh, is it now two years ago launch that we did from Wallops uh, on the uh, NG I think that was NG13, and the next one is gonna be NG15, and then we have NG16 for our CubeSat. So in a nutshell, uh, basically the, the paper and the presentation, if you had a chance to look at it, really center on how we introduce the students not only to aspects that were really reachable and attainable to them, but to actual scientific research that was cutting edge. And so without really boiling it down, we were able to uh, utilize them to move those, uh, those scientific missions forward without any problems. Thank you, Royce. Uh, you, you, very interesting paper in Yay Wallops and Yay Coast Guard, uh, good partners there. Uh, you had several components to the initiative that you discussed. If you had to select one or two that you think is most beneficial in recruiting and training your new officers coming up, is there one or two that you would identify? Sure, you know, I think the, the number one thing that's uh, the biggest inhibitor, and it's also what I would call the golden ticket to uh, recruiting is actually climate. And so where people think that, uh, you know, you have bells and whistles, like we have a wonderful new ground station, we have this beautiful, you know, FinSAT program, we have access to all these uh, facilities, both at AFIT and at the Coast Guard Academy and the other uh, military institutions, but if, if we don't have a great climate, if we don't create a climate of uh, respect along with all of our, that's actually real and not just the window dressing, then we won't be able to retain or recruit. So I think the biggest thing is the fact that uh, our teams, when they work together, they spend a lot of time understanding each other. They spend a lot of time building their psychologically safe spaces so they can have some, uh, more, uh, get some, some cultural competence. And then that actually makes our science work so much better. So all the problems that we solve, we, did, we, we take the hard problems first, and then the science problems we are actually able to deal with pretty regularly as they come up. All right, thank you. Just another quick question. Obviously, I was impressed as a former high school teacher to see that you were reaching and working with the ThinSats with your high school. What would you say was the main benefit both to your cadets and the, in the Coast Guard and the high school students doing the ThinSat? 
Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for asking, Joyce. The, we've been working with the high schools uh, specifically in, in this type of way in our spill program for over 12 years. And so the, the, the biggest takeaway is that they have just as much to offer us as we have to offer them. <laughs> understand that specifically the, everything just opens wide open so uh, we've been using this innovation and learning model that's been uh, amazing they've actually helped us design courses for our programs for our cadets so i can't really say enough about the high schoolers they've been amazing well keep up the great work thanks yeah i agree high schoolers can totally be impressive and um young folks these days overall. So thank you so much, Rice. Uh, apologies for the confusion on the speakers earlier. Um, we're gonna, yeah, we have we have a couple more follow up questions for you. But again, we'll take them um, from the Q&A. Um, so if you do have questions, do throw them into the Q&A icon down there. Just a reminder, if you've just come in, that's where we're putting questions. And we'll um, get through those um, after we've gone through all of our panelist intros. Um, our next panelist is um, Aaron Abwa. Um, who is talking about a uh, methodology for successful university graduate CubeSat programs. Um, and he's here from um, University of Colorado at Boulder, um, was the team that he was working with um, that the paper is about. So Aaron, why don't you go ahead? Thanks for, yeah, thanks for uh, having me. Appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, so we uh, wrote a paper at the University of Colorado called the methodology for successful university graduate CubeSat programs. And basically what we wanted to do was take the last 10 years of experience of developing CubeSats and building, testing, and operating them at the university and sort of coalesce that down into a strategy that we felt um, sort of represents sort of where we are after 10 years of doing that um, as a university. And so we, we talked a little bit about sort of the overall strategy and the context of the Maxwell CubeSat mission, which we expect to launch sometime next year. And then uh, we also go into detail a little bit about some of the the, what we call the tall poles. So the hardest challenges that we've faced over the last 10 years and sort of how we approach uh, moving to tackle those challenges and those we at least identify in the abstract and we go into more, some more detail in the paper in addition to uh, the general overview of how we run CubeSat projects. But those are really, uh, like we mentioned earlier, student turnover, software and documentation. Um, so we also present our strategies on how to use those um, and how do we run those to sort of create the most efficient and effective way to move through those as you go through a CubeSat program, uh, especially in a university environment. Thank you, Erin. Yes, um, it, you have to read that paper because you've got a lot of uh, suggestions for concerns that everybody deals with when you're doing student programs. So uh, do you know if any of the undergraduate students, because I know you use some of those with the graduate program, do they very often tend to go on and uh, continue to a graduate degree, or do you know? Um, actually, yeah, actually, I'm one of those undergraduate students that ended <laughs> up turning into a, a graduate degree. And so uh, I think there are, there are certainly some motivated undergraduate students that you'll see them uh, kind of start to volunteer a little bit with the project or the program. Um, and if they're really motivated, we, we often see them uh, They'll, they'll grow into the program, they'll, they'll become an integral part of that program, uh, and then they'll typically come after, a, they'll go after a graduate degree, whether it's within the same university or uh, using that experience to leverage an advantage um, towards gaining interest in another program that they might be interested in. So um, certainly there are, we've seen some very motivated undergraduates um, become very important parts and very uh, dedicated and extremely useful people to have uh, to push those programs forward. What kind of feedback do you get from your graduate students on what was the most valuable aspect of being involved in the CubeSat program? Uh, that's a great question. I think uh, from a feedback standpoint from graduate students, I think they certainly appreciate a lot of the hardware experience that we get to see on the CubeSat programs. Uh, oftentimes they, uh, they like to have the ability to, even if it may not be quite related to the research they're doing, they do get some experience in testing and understanding how uh, the hardware side of things fits into the theoretical and the science side. And so at least from a graduate standpoint, uh, that seems to be a very popular way to become involved in the CubeSat programs is that opportunity to play around with the hardware and get some real hands-on experience that will help them push either towards their specific research or at least give them an idea of what the hardware side of things looks like and that can help inform their research and the way that they approach their, 
uh, their projects or their thesis um, depending. All right, thank you. Um, we'll move on, but the other thing I thought was important, you address the value of having consistent faculty involved. So when we get to the questions at the end, tell me how you do that. How do you keep the same faculty involved? Because they have a lot of other. Yeah, I, I would agree that having other Absolutely. faculty on board is, yeah. is, is challenging. Um, it looks like Joyce might have frozen for a second, at least on my feet. So we'll um, go ahead with our next intro. Um, um, so up next, we have the, um, the ITAS Space Center and its role in space education in Brazil. Um, and for that, we have Willer Gomez dos Santos here to talk with us. So welcome, Willer. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, first of all, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. So our paper presents the ITA Space Center. I am a professor there. And we also present its mission in the formation of human resources and in the research and development of space products. So in 2012, we have the first aerospace engineering graduated at ITA. And since then, many efforts have been done to improve the engineering education. The first effort was the development of uh, our first CubeSat called ISP14. Then we have also the ITASAT1, another CubeSat, but this time a 6U CubeSat. Uh, these two projects opened the opportunity for the creation of the ITA Space Center, uh, who, whose acronym is SEI, it's called SEI, C I C E I. Uh, then inside its facilities, the ITA Space Center provides capabilities for the development of space, small space projects, such as electronics, software engineering, mechanical design, and simulation with the aid of system engineering and project management. By means of the graduate and undergraduate programs, the ITA Space Center is providing education and integration with the industries and other partner organizations. In development and delivering space products and fostering higher education in space, the ITA Space Center is accomplishing of its proposed mission. So that's, that's a brief summary. Then I'm here for questions. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Willer. Um, so I was going to ask a little bit about um, your student teams and how they are formed and who's on them um, and what, what kinds of participation um, you have from your students. Great, great question. We have around 20 to 25 people in our team. From these people, only four are professor. The other are graduate and undergraduate students. Then we have the students from many levels, from the starting the beginning of the, degree, the course degrees at the final, and they are developing their academic works, like graduation works or master thesis, uh, doctorate thesis, depends on the level of the, the students. And they are very uh, focused on the, on the projects, on the real project of the ETA Space Center. Awesome. Thanks, Lillard. Um, the other question is, um, where, where do um, your team members go after completing their theses and their graduation, after having this experience with CubeSats, um, with ITA? Um, what kinds of places do they end up in, in Brazil or internationally? So, we have two kinds of students, the military people and the civilian people. The military people goes to the Air Force, Brazilian Air Force, to work in some unity of the Brazilian Air Force here in Brazil. And the civilian people goes to the aerospace companies here. We have actually uh, currently 26 industries, is companies of the aerospace here in Brazil. Then they can work in every place of that. Very cool. I will come back with some of the extra questions that we have in the Q&A and also a couple more on my own of the, some of the unique sighting of Brazil for some of the um, ionospheric and space observations um, and oh. what motivates a lot of the missions. But we'll, we'll come back to that okay. and we'll give everyone a, a chance to do their intro. So we're going to go ahead and um, talk a little bit to um, Fabian Aper, who I think is up next. Um, to talk about ISAT, a great student adventure within the French Space Agency. Um, 
leading up to lessons learned from orbit, which are the best kinds of lessons. Um, certainly, there are lessons on the ground as well. <laughs> um, but the ones from orbit really stick with you. Um, <laughs> welcome, Fabian. Uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So yeah, ISAT um, has been a very challenging project. Um, it has been developed by 250 students at uh, the French Space Agency, uh, CNES. Um, it's a three year CubeSat uh, with a lot of um, innovative subsystems uh, that uh, were developed within the R&D programs uh, of, the, of the Space Agency. Uh, it was launched on December 18th last year um, and since then, it has proved to be fully functional and we are operating uh, the CubeSat. Um, it has uh, started um, its mission, uh, which is the uh, very first uh, space mission dedicated to the observation of the zodiacal light. Uh, so it's the sunlight scattered by uh, inter interplanetary dust particles. Um, uh, so it's an astronomy mission uh, with um, uh, a very uh, uh, good performance to have, especially uh, concerning the pointing accuracy. Um, so I, I'm ready now to uh, answer you your question. Since Joyce isn't here um, uh, yet, back, I'll ask one of her questions, and I have some in mind too, but I want to make sure hers get asked uh -huh. too. Um, so she had a question, how did your students react to the software crashing after five months of the mission? Did they realize it was a possibility or were they very disappointed? I, I know um, this is coming from someone who's had lots of on-orbit failures. <laughs> so, so managing expectations can be very challenging. How, how, how did you guys handle that? How did they react to, to what I To the your... software challenges. To the software challenges? Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you, mean, you, you mean by the, the challenges of operating a CubeSat? Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, so... Um, we had a lot of development to do uh, concerning the the control center uh, and we uh, bring a lot of automations in in the software so at the beginning it was um, it took a long time to operate the cubesat we had to be every day and almost every night in the control center uh, but then we uh, brought a lot of automation in the software and so now we can do uh, some uh, routine operations without uh, going there so it was very uh, nice periods uh, to work in this part. Cool. Um, thanks. Yeah, I agree that sometimes when you can get to re remote operations, that's pretty nice. Um, um, so another question that Joyce had um, was, have any of your former students started their own companies or um, joined relatively new space companies? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we um, a lot of our former students uh, are now working on the uh, space uh, industry, and um, myself, myself, I created a, a startup company uh, that uh, builds uh, nano satellites, and uh, within the company we have a lot of uh, former students from the ISAT projects, uh, and uh, it's a very a nice adventure. I mean, the adventure continues now uh, within the private sector, and so it's very, uh, um, it's very nice. It's very great. I, I think I would agree that the private sector definitely has adventure, um, <laughs> and, and a lot of um, stress and responsibility sometimes. Yeah. Too. <laughs> um, so we'll go ahead and um, have our our last. Um, panelist who's currently online, if a couple people happen to join later, we'll, we'll manage. Um, but we have um, the um, Shelly Galliant, who's here from um, the um, Space Force, I guess, to, to talk about um, US um, MA Space Cadets First Class Plus, um, so United States Military Academy at West Point. Um, we'd love to hear more about um, your um, paper. So 
So Lee. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Major Galleon. I'm the United States Air Force. Actually, I, I was given the opportunity to switch to the Space Force. Oh, okay. And, <laughs> so Air Force, uh, got it. I, I'm already a prior Marine and the, the future opportunities for me and my career uh, aren't available in the Space Force yet. So I decided to uh, stick with the Air Force and just have two services when, when I retire. But uh, it's really awesome opportunity to be here. What my paper and my my presentation really focused on was the time frame from 2009 to now. And in 2009, uh, Major Pugsley, now Colonel Pugsley, saw an issue with the disparity at the United States Military Academy at West Point compared to the other service academies in the development of space professionals. So he came in as an FA-40, which is a, a space operations officer for the Army. And he was able to see that there was quite a big disparity between operational space in the Army and the undergraduate level of education that was being provided at the uh, other service academies compared to West Point. So once he identified that problem, he started off on a what turned out to be a 12-year project to get West Point to parity or close to parity with it's other service academies in developing space professionals. And we were able to graduate our first class of cadets with a Bachelor of Science in Space Science. So from 2009 to now is, is the time that it took to develop a curriculum that was space centric. So now we offer the space science major and minor, and there's a lot of uh, cadets that are jumping on board that they're looking forward to that opportunity. One of the other uh, duties that I have here is looking at cadets who want to cross commission into the Air Force and now into the Space Force. So that's one of the opportunities that I get to talk to them about. And I think we're getting more interest in the space science program because of that. And we also know that the Army itself is the biggest customer when it comes to military space based applications and, and services that are provided from GPS communications, they are the biggest user. So in those nine years, we went from uh, one class that was space centric and tried to cover a little bit of everything. And it grew into a multidisciplinary major. So it still wasn't a space science major, but it, it brought in some more of the departments, uh, electrical engineering and uh, geography and environmental engineering and some of those, and we came together and had a, a multi -dis multidisciplinary science major, and that finally morphed into the space and missile defense program, which offers a space science major and minor. So I've had one year here, and I've been teaching core physics, and this semester I'm moving into the SP-471, the Introduction to Astronautics course, and I have my awesome classroom that I, that I just moved into a couple weeks ago. So I'm really looking forward to, to interacting with the cadets that are very focused on the space related material and they're very excited to be a part of this and as soon as the major was announced uh, some cadets from another department came over to the physics and engineering department which hosts the space science major and they told them hey we think this is awesome and we want to build rockets and the department head couldn't say no so last year they started on a project called spear uh, and they named it uh, for uh, space engineering and applied research and they worked with a couple other uh, universities to try to reach the Kármán line and, and, and get a rocket through uh, it was Operation Space was the name of the program. So now I'm also taking over as a research advisor the, the rocket portion. On top of that we're also building payloads for CubeSats and looking at a, uh, a CubeSat bus development as well. So we're trying to grow the program back uh, in 2009, they started with a 1U CubeSat Black Knight 1, and it was finally got manifested at a launch, but they weren't able to contact it. So in the rest of my tenure here, I hope to grow the program and uh, definitely will be talking to Commander James at the Coast Guard Academy and the other uh, research labs and things. So I'm trying to do the same thing and, and grow the program as much as possible and give the cadets as much of a wide ranging experience and hands on experience so they can take that with them when they depart here. Thanks so much, Shelley. Thanks for clarifying the um, structure as well. Um, 
I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, how you break it down um, from teaching the basic principles of operation, like the key physical equations, power, thermal, um, to the hands-on experiments. That's always a challenge even, even for us um, in, in academia. So um, it, it'd be great to hear about how you connect hands-on with, with uh, basic physics. Right, so uh, all I've been doing this summer is really developing the course for the SP-471 astronauts that I'm teaching. And one of my goals was to make sure that if we do go remote, that the cadets have everything they need as far as material to make that happen. But that is really the first uh, look they have at how those, like you said, the equations and things like that and the, and the basic astronautics course can tie into the research projects that are available to us. So right now, like we have uh, SPEAR, which is a rocket-centric program. They're looking to build a two-stage sounding rocket. They have Black Knight Satellite, which is looking to build uh, buses, and uh, they're, they're researching the ability to harden Raspberry Pis to make uh, some affordable CubeSat buses. And then we have in the, in the physics and nuclear engineering department, we have a couple payloads that we're working on. One has to do with uh, radiation, the other one they're, they're doing magnetometers. So uh, we introduce them to, to the basic physics of, of space and the astronautics course. And then we, we kind of recruit them from there. And they, they, they tend to come earlier and earlier, even before they get into the, the space specific courses in their junior and senior year, they, they try to get on very early with the capstone research projects we have. So by the time we're seeing that by the time they get to the space centric courses, their, their knowledge level is quite high because they've had the opportunity to work real world hardware and, and software on, on the research projects. I, I agree that um, it's great to get that real world experience um, and criticality um, even before you get on uh, um, industry or um, larger program, um, defense program um, mission. So um, at this point, we are through all of our panelist intros that are, that are here. Um, and we have um, questions coming in um, in Q&A, which is where we prefer to get them. And a couple are coming in in the chat as well, although the chat is mostly full of accolades and comments for you guys, so you can check that out. Um, I'm going to circle back um, to the top of the questions um, uh, just to get back to Cassandra really quick. Um, so we had a question from Adrian from Inzano. Um, who initiated the ArcSat project? Is there any community outreach? Uh, so it was started before my time. I can't say for sure who initiated it. Uh, my advisor has been involved on it throughout its inception, I believe. Um, we have a couple other collaborat collaborators um, in the state of Arkansas. Um, Arkansas is an EBSCOR state, so most of our funding comes from NASA EBSCOR um, RID and NASA EBSCOR ISS. Um, we do some community outreach. We haven't as much this past year. Um, we've been to like STEM fairs. I think there are some tentative plans in the near future to um, get undergrad students from an HBCU in the state um, to help with some of our fabrication. Um, so yeah, there is ongoing uh, research. Some of it has been, or sorry, outreach. Uh, some of it has been kind of delayed because of COVID. Great, thanks, Cassandra. Um, we had, did have one other related question, which was, um, do you blink your LED on ARCS, that one? And is that used for comms at all or low rate communication? Yes, no kinds of things. Uh, we are not planning to use it for um, like data transmission or anything like that. Uh, the concerning factor on its operation is actually thermal requirements because it's pretty high power for a CubeSat. It's nominally like 36 volts. Um, and it's like 11 to 12,000 lumens. Um, so no, we're not planning on doing data transmission and we are a little limited uh, due to thermal requirements. All right, great. Thank you so much, Cassandra. Um, and we had one more quick question, which was um, how, what happens to the balloon um, during deorbit? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Um, so ideally it would stay somewhat inflated, uh, so it's not fully, we don't utilize all the material to inflate it initially, so we can continue to do ongoing inflation if it's um, impacted by micrometeoroids and things like that, um, but ideally it's more or less intact enough to 
uh, put drag on the on the spacecraft. Okay, and then I, I guess at some point it burns up. So awesome. Thanks, Cassandra. Um, so we had uh, another question. Um, this one for the Coast Guard. So Royce, um, um, how many students are impacted by the Coast Guard projects and um, how diverse are your teams? Diversity is always a challenge, um, I think, for engineering across the board. So this is a good question. This is also from Adrian Provenzano. Hey, thanks, Adrian. I, I appreciate the question. Um, I, I think that uh, impacts are really an interesting, you know, we, as a physicist, I'm thinking about, you know, the qualitative versus the quantitative, right? So if I'm, you know, doing straight numbers, I can tell you how many students that I've had involved with SPILL since its inception in 2011, all the way up to until present. And I can tell you how many, uh, you know, students have been involved with the Coast Guard Academy, how many students have been involved in homeschool, homeschoolers and the high school. And I, so I could take those numbers and I could throw them all out at you, but the impacts are much, much greater. So we have uh, capstone students, capstone projects that have been going now for three years working on CubeSats out of uh, two different uh, departments or two different, uh, we call them sections, but you larger schools like West Point would call them departments, <laughs> but they we're a little bit smaller than they are. And so uh, that, that's a much, you know, it's, the impacts are really, really wide in that respect. So we've had 30 kids uh, in the last couple of years, if I take the three years that we've been actively working in this stage of spill with the FinSats and bringing them through that have gone, you know, through some fashion of the program from homeschoolers and uh, middle school and high schoolers. And then we've had, I think the numbers are 13 uh, cadets that, oh no, actually it's more than that because I forgot. So if I do that same three year span, I'm talking about 15 cadets when I do all of the capstones, but then that worked in the lab that worked on these, that's another six cadets, right? And so right now there's a master student who um, at AFIT, that's my master student who is a, a, a second lieutenant in the Air Force uh, who started off as a Coastie. So there's a lot of cross services going on. I actually started off Army too. So I guess we just, none of us stay anywhere. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but so that's where we are there and um, that's starting to grow, right? So eventually we're gonna have a, hopefully a PhD student working uh, on this project as well. So there's, there's just a lot of impact, right? I, I can't even say enough about the impacts. And as far as diversity, I, I'm gonna really repeat, we, we, we are really serious about tackling that climate issue immediately. We, uh, we make community agreements. Who in the military does community agreements? We do, right? <laughs> we, we are, we're very intentional about creating safe spaces and, and making those safe spaces. We also are really intentional about that from like, uh, it's one of those things where if you, if you, if you actually actively make build programs with a certain uh, demographic in mind and you actually reach out to those people and ask them to partner with you to say, hey, I don't understand this, help me build this program, they actually do it and then they feel comfortable and then other people that, that also don't feel comfortable start to feel more comfortable. And it's not so much that it's a, a, a roadmap, it's actually a way of operating. It's literally an operator, right? We're taking gradients and curls here, not actually doing the math. So uh, it's, it becomes a way of, of way we just do business. So that's actually graduated up all the way to my, our master's in, in graduate school. We've just done that all the way through and we continue to, to really implicit, uh, implicitly bring in people and ask them, what is it that you wanna do to do this? And they get excited and they tell us and then we just do it. <laughs> and then lo and behold, the hit more people come. So great question. Great, thanks, thanks, Rose. I, I agree that um, those approaches are, are very successful in making people comfortable and, and increasing the both diversity and the um, impact. So um, we have we have a kind of <laughs> teasing question for Aaron from Scott Palo, um, which I'll throw out there. Which is with all of the exciting CubeSat projects at CU, why would you ever leave? Um, <laughs> But there's there's a real there's a real question um and there for you too, which is um how do the students find your programs and projects? Um are they advertised in classes or on campus or do you rely on word of mouth and student groups like SEDS or AIAA to have students um kind of find you and get engaged? All right, well our quick teaser answer for uh for Professor Palo. I was still trying to decide if leaving was the right decision. Um, but in terms of uh, getting the word out about the CubeSat programs and how we 
uh, try to make students aware of them. I think over the last uh, few years, there's been a lot of work to especially sort of raise awareness and refine our strategy about how we let students know that these programs exist, that there's opportunities, and that those opportunities are not specific to only aerospace students, but there's also opportunities, um, especially from folks on the electrical side, folks on the computer engineering side. Um, so we've done a much better job of trying to reach out to other departments, and whether that's through um, people like Professor Paylor or Professor Marshall, talking to their professor contacts in those other departments, or by talking to the graduate advisors that kind of send those blast emails out to all the graduate students all at once. Um, and then we've also been able to raise awareness as well through the graduate projects program where uh, the graduate project system will also essentially organize a large, here's all the projects and what they're all about and we'll present a short little, uh, you know, five minute teaser about what the project is and the sort of positions that we need to fill and the kind of personnel that we're looking for. And then also just to raise general awareness so that if anyone is interested, um, we're, we're, very, we're, we're trying to be very good about making sure that people, if they're interested, that even if we may not have a specific need for their skill set, we'll try to get them involved as best we can so that they can continue to contribute to the program and just instead of just uh, turning them down. So we try, to, we try to raise awareness as best we can through using you know, word of mouth among professors, word of mouth among students. We encourage the students that are currently working on the programs to talk to their friends and have them come out for a meeting and say hi and learn a little bit about what the team looks like and see if they're interested. And then also by trying to use the university resources, so the graduate advisors, um, and then setting up uh, the sort of information sessions that are more broad and try to give a, a better outreach to, you know, a large number of students, um, at least for a statistical chance of at least gathering a few that might be interested or say, hey, this is something interesting, or at least there's free pizza at this event and I'll at least come for the free pizza and then maybe I'll learn something at the same time. Yeah, the free food usually works um, both for undergrads, grad students, and even faculty. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> all around. Um, we had a, 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 another question that I'm going to direct to Matthew, which is, um, what kinds of missions do you think your software-defined radiometer system is best suited for? Are you thinking more Earth mission applications, or could you even do astro astronomy and astrophysics missions with it? Um, it, it? Right now, it's being geared towards more of the Earth type of missions. Um, so the soil moisture and ocean salinity um, are the two that we're kind of focusing on right now. Um, but it absolutely could be used for uh, astronomy as well, too. There's really no reason why it can't be. Um, the, the hardware, it would probably just be some tweaking, maybe some recalibration on it, and it would probably be fine for any kind of um, astronomy-related uh, work as well, too. But right now, we are going to have it just point at the Earth and take those kinds of readings from it. So. Okay, cool. I I'm, I'm have past history with projects with microwave radiometers, so I can think of lots of different things to, to take a look at. Yep. Um, this, this question's for Fabian. Um, what were some of the challenges? Um, you mentioned 250 students, so this is a, one of the questions um, in the Q&A. What were the challenges incorporating 250 students into um, working on a, on a 3U CubeSat? That's a lot. Yeah, it's uh, quite, a, quite a big challenge. Well, the, the project started in 2012 and was launched in 2019. So it's a quite, a quite a long time. And so that's the reason why uh, we had so much students working on the project. Um, and another thing is, um, of course, we developed the CubeSat itself, but we developed also all the space system around. So the ground segment with the control center, uh, mission center, and all the a ground support equipment we need to test the CubeSat on ground. So it's a lot of, uh, a lot of work and so that's why we had so much students working on every subject. And uh, the, tur the turnover was uh, really hard uh, to manage. So we, um, the, the, what you need to do is to have a good documentation and uh, some people to um, uh, supervise this documentation to make sure that every student um, yeah, so hard. yeah every student writes uh, what uh, he did uh, on the projects uh, and I think that's that's the key 
Um, and then you need um, a team of um, young engineers, for example, that's uh, what uh, we had on ISAT and I was a part of uh, this team, a team of young engineers that are on uh, the project and that are supervising uh, the students and that can um, uh, transfer the knowledge from one team of students to the next team, to the next generation. And it's a, um, a good solution to uh, manage the turnover. I, I agree that managing turnover and information propagation and documentation are super good ways to use that many people. <laughs> so, yep. Um, for Willer, um, I'm, I'm going to follow up with um, the questions from um, earlier um, and also from Q&A, um, what are some of the um, benefits to being in Brazil? Um, it has advantages in terms of being near the equator and having places near the equator for ionospheric measurements and observations. Can you talk a little bit about some of the unique geographic um, capabilities of having paired satellites and ground stations? Yes, we have many exotic phenomena here, like the uh, South Atlantic anomaly. Then we have the uh, decrease in the geomagnetic equator. And we have also plasma bubbles in the ionosphere that provoke the scintillation phenomenon. And this phenomenon interferes with the communication of the satellites with the aircrafts, for example. Then we have some devices to, to alert the aircraft or to, to, to send an information to the aircraft to prevent some kind of problem. Uh, it's, these devices work very well in the North Hemisphere, but here it's not work very well because the models of the ionospheres works for that side, but here, because of the ionosphere problem or because of the pl plasma bubbles, the mathematical models are not uh, very accurately. Then we have to do many experiments in situ on orbit. Né? That's our proposal uh, to study the ionosphere and to improve the, co the communication and from the satellites to the aircrafts then that is the reason why it is important. I, I, know, I don't know if I'm, I was clear or not, but that's... I yeah, no, that, that's very clear. It's, it's a very comprehensive sy system where you have both ground, air, and space all interrelated with communication challenges and the physical phenomena in Brazil. It's, it's a really unique environment. Yes. Um, for Shelley, we have um, some questions about um, how small businesses um, can get involved um, in some of the educational programs that um, West Point is um, working with in the space science degree. Um, I, they have technologies or payload ideas or engagement with um, project concepts that they'd like to work with um, government contractors for. Um, is there a way for them to get involved? I'm not sure if that went through. Um, but um, anyway, um, we, we did have another question from, um, from Citadel Military College in Charleston who are interested um, in computer science and cybersecurity and um, wondering um, if it's possible for their students to get involved um, in some of the Coast Guard programs. Uh, so, so absolutely uh, <laughs> is the answer always when we talk about uh, growing our footprint and our uh, our collaborations. And I don't want to take up too much time for other panelists to ask to answer questions, but I we can sp we can speak offline absolutely about about that. And so you can find my information uh, on there. But just to offer to anybody, the Coast Guard Academy is literally always looking. It, we're a little different than the other service academies and, and just in the amount of sheer time that we have, our students are very limited. And so going off one of the things I think it was maybe Aaron was talking about and utilizing uh, the professors, utilizing the faculty. So our faculty are our touch points and then we, we funnel our students through. So that's how we maintain our continuity. So happy to speak more. And I'm sure uh, Major Gallion would say the same thing um, with uh, Lieutenant Colonel, uh, John Hart Hartke, <laughs> who's the department head out there at physics. I knew I could get it. Uh, I know he's really committed to that. I'll pass it over to the major. 
Yeah, we're, we're the same way. So that's one thing that we think is very, very precious is our cadets time because they don't have any of it. So uh, the fact that they want to go out and do hands on research and make things happen is, is awesome. And we try to utilize the summers as much as possible. They don't have a lot of time during that either. But uh, they're very motivated and they will find cool and fun things to do and they'll bring it back to us. So we, we've had that happen quite a bit. So we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Um, we had a quick reminder from um, the um, spacetrack.org, so the military tracking of CubeSats to make sure student projects and educational projects are registered with them so they can help you out. Um, it's really nice to get their support in finding and communicating with your spacecraft and also knowing when there are going to be conjunctions or near near calls with other, other satellites, which happens more often than you think sometimes in low Earth orbit. Um, so just a reminder for educational institutions to remember to um, submit a form, register with them. They're friendly. They're very helpful talking with them. Um, so uh, just to follow up there. So we'll go ahead and um, I think wrap up um, and thank our speakers again. So I'm going to applaud um, with my mute off. Um, if you'd like to unmute to applaud, now would be a good time. <laughs> we'll let you do that. And just thank everyone again for their time and I appreciate everyone. So thank you very much. Um, great feedback and um, engagement with everyone. Thanks.